All right, Nat part one, natural fa nature fallacy and the Varnas. Um, one of the most important and vital things has come to our possession in many ways with our species that no other animal wields like we do. It is used depending on a lot of circumstances in our history. At base, some could claim that the phantom drive to survive with lots of kids still flows through us, and with greater understanding from these things, eventually caught the impulse by its tail at the last, uh, at the last second as it brings us forward with it. But it's not just in our nature to have kids and accept it. No, not at all. I would argue it's a common strategy to avoid unwanted children in other species, such as playing dead, running, uh, not victim blaming by the way, separate organs, certain matriarchies like giraffes and elephants, but that's just my guess. And another strat being tossing a kid aside or sitting on a child to suffocate it. Uh, I think cats will do that unfortunately. Um, nature avoids unwanted children and rape, or at least the parties within the, the, what we call nature. Um, but humans project the beast out to get us all. At the very least, nature is a hypocrite, but it doesn't deserve agency when thinking of events. I'm not justifying that in context. Again, I'm only using the parties involved, not the concept of nature as a as a like an artistic like uh, philosophical like thought um, our avoidance of children is I would argue laws that define social acceptance this would be maybe more valid if a quote higher entity was looking in observing us like zoos it's obviously a bit more complicated for humans though we have existential dread with death, not just for ourselves, but onto others, and pre-others, apparently, as in a fetus or ball of cells. Now, I'm probably going to be bringing up some stuff from other videos I've made, but it still plays into it consistently. Um, BCE myths promoted the idea of pre-formation, a Russian, a Russian nest doll concept where a miniature is inside the sperm cell, the soul bearing the sins of the past deeds, quote, floating in the first parent's loins, some Christian scholars say, I think. But the recent foundation of our species that we look up to, Egypt, Greece, and Rome, the very people whose bodies, philosophies, and stoic behaviors we use as an aesthetic for our own academia setting to the point of the real founding fathers, these very ancient societies practiced our modern day fears. As stated by Aristotle in 1550 BCE, quote, when couples have children in excess, let abortion be produced before sense and life has begun. And elsewhere around the world, such as Egyptian medical texts, the Ebers papyrus suggested a way to abort by using honey, various plant fibers, and dates, and dates which somehow causes a miscarriage reaction. Romans apparently didn't consider it murder at all, but a front on the male who planted a seed, so it was still like frowned upon. So sparing his feelings, I guess. <laughs> um, in the current time, those who oppose it call it murder or infanticide. The people who cherish it, abortion or a right. And eventually, once humanity used it as a weapon, it was called eugenics. Though this term overlaps with those who don't favor abortion as a form of concern trolling, or they're actually being honest with themselves, but anyways. But to think context does not matter, to even, to even fathom saying, think of the children, is woman blind, that the body does not matter, looking past a heartbeat to find another in the ambiguous quest for determining life. So even though abortion, for better or worse, occurred, accepted at certain moments, I assume, which plays into eugenics since for it to be abortion it requires ability of validated consent, though I may be projecting my point by making these three distinctions of context. Anyways, ancient times obviously imagined purity, using the model of the Pythagorean theorem and its math. Plato writing in the Republic goes into a disturbing prophecy to come, 
for when your guardians are ignored of the laws of birth and goes on to say about having kids out of season, expressing they would never be good or fortunate. This was after Pythagoras was dead, I think, so. Uh, the perceived genetic utopia would be unraveled thousands of years later when Francis Galton coined the word eugenics in 1900, meaning well-born, and dysgenic, the people they want uh, removed. But I use the former to generalize the general awfulness. Anyways, the word that nobody says in modern times, but only have become more entrenched and saturated behind the hush words of a near polite society. Sadly, the caste system of bigoted opinions, biases, financial and census bureau cement itself into population monitoring and justifying its own paranoia with the hierarchy, the caste we call race. It's possible there has always been caste systems since a civilization began once we evolved out of hunter-gatherer, horticultural, etc. types of living. My research is obviously focused on Europe, Western first world and Western inspired society. But it's important to note the idea of caste started millennia ago. Originally, the concept of division was known elsewhere as Varnas in ancient India. Manu, or what is known in India, was the first man with the knowledge of pre-universe mysticism and had knowledge of the one who is beyond senses to save his kind, and just like Noah and Gilgamesh before them, from the great flood that one beyond senses laid to begin with. A man once asked Manu, Please, Lord, tell us precisely in the proper order the laws of our social classes as well as those born in between. And from the groundwork of destruction that the flood brought was the, var was the ancient Varnas. This is him explaining it, by the way. First, with producing pristine Brahmins, the layer who speaks to God, the brain of the caste body. From the one's mouth, yeah, he spits out the God and the God speaker from his mouth. Then, uh, Kishtriya from his hands, the authority figures of society, all the way down to the one's thighs via the Vaishya, supply chain level that produces goods and the lowest caste to walk all over, the Shudra, a slave figure. But the Varna extends past its body, as even the dirt below the feet, so to speak, have been given agency in the Hindu lore called the Untouchables, currently coined Dalit, translating to broken or scattered due to spiritual karma from past lives. Minus the caste, minus the caste body, I mentioned the flood and repopulation of the earth follows the same line as the Noah's Ark story. After the great flood, the chosen human by God, Noah and his sons populate the planet once the ark landed on the Caucasus Mountains or Ararat Mountains, um, or colloquially called White Mountain, ironically implying the true human origin as white. One day, Ham and his son and another saw Noah unconscious and lying naked. Some say because he was drunk. Noah saw them mocking him. It angered him so much that he cursed his son Ham via his descendants, specifically his son Can. The cursed child is said to have peopled Africa in the world, in the words of first century military historian Flavius Josephus, and the Bible referring to Egypt as the land of Ham. Though despite the obvious sounding connection, the implication is false etymology. The, ball, the iron ball of the term slave, which come from the Slavic people as one of the first contexts for the term slave and enslavement before the Western world. This ball of caste, this iron ball of caste and false etymology was carried into the slave holding 17th century as the word ham meant burnt or hot just because of the location association and temperature. Um, using the same logic, preacher Cotton Mather claimed the dark souls of Africans could repent via ideology of, quote, assimilation, that Africans could be white once turned Christian. Specifically mentioning 
the American and Indian struggle in history is quite relevant. The overlap of America and Indian Barnas is well documented and symbolic of one another. As one Dalit journalist V.T. Raj Shekhar notes, quote, Perhaps only the Jews have as long a history of suffering from discrimination as the Dalit, quote, however, when we consider the nature of the suffering endured by the Dalits, it is only the African-American parallel of enslavement, apartheid, and forced assimilation that comes to mind, end quote. Isabella Wilkerson, in her book Caste, makes the observation that India and America both experienced abolition and their own civil rights, the U.S. in 1960s and India in 1940s, and quotes a description of the 2017 book Ground Down by Growth. Quote, the colonial powers officially abolished slavery in India and the U.S. India in 1843 and America in 1865. In, uh, but this simply led to its transformation into bondage through relations of debt, which would be called debt peonage by scholars. Isabella also goes deeper into the connection, such as affirmative action in the U.S. and reservations in India having the same qualities. Thomas Jefferson wrote, in 1776, all men are created equal, but of course we know this layer of constitutional platitude was built over the lowest caste, built over the dirt. As much as Jefferson lamented not being able to free his slaves, the society needed them as they, helped them, as they held up the nation on their backs, the mortgage to free them unpaid and technically not his. Despite the dislike of slavery, he still confessed African Americans were inferior to whites. This oddly enough extends to some Native Americans who he felt more respect for them. As people that were brave defending their land and Jefferson thinking they could be civilized into the white caste, the Cherokee had attempted treaties that were trampled on or signed into desperation, such as the New Echoda in 1835. Even a man known as Sequoia created a literacy created a literacy and their own constitution for his people in 1820s, also endowing himself in Anglo clothing to fit the Anglo society, of course. Though Jefferson's opinion was meaningless in the grand scheme as the, relative, as the natives continued to be decimated by colonial expansion, while an Andrew Jackson's reign caused natives to relocate more via the Trail of Tears by gunpoint, um, but there were a lot of Cherokee who couldn't believe they were going to be forced, like, like Chief John, who had been elected by the governor of the Cherokee, who had been elected to govern the Cherokee, sorry. But technically, the U.S. government were just going to take it away. The natives always living with strings attached. One survivor note of the trail goes on to say, Long time we travel on our way to the new land. People feel bad when they leave the old nation. Women cry and make sad wails. Children cry and many men cry, but they say nothing and just put their heads down and keep on go towards the west. Many days pass and people die very much. It's said a thousand Cherokees escaped the roundup and es established themselves eventually in North Carolina. They were recognized for this and allowed to create their own government in 1868, although today there is an oddity spin for tourist attractions, especially with Native American reservations. Western colonialism used to remind us with symbolic heads on the wall of its dominance, nations conquered, and its national superiority, such as in the 1904 Louisiana, uh, where it held its largest event, the St. Louis, Louis World Fair. It showcased people as human zoos to compare ourselves, showing levels of humanity from the caste-based perspective, showing an old remnant of American time called Old Plantation, enacting slave life. The fair gathered Native Americans to reenact their lives. Apache tribesmen such as Geronimo, known as the last native to surrender to the American government, I think, signed autographs to Anglo fans. 
and there was Congolese people that were captured and one such individual Oda Benga who used who was used in multiple exhibits like the Bronx Zoo the man being exotified as quote the missing link 40 years after abolition of slavery in America and stole individuals from the Philippines after having won them via Philippine American War and the Anu family from Japan uh, Patagonians and other indigenous people a Philippine tribe known as the Igorot. In their culture, they kill a dog for a sacred moment and eat it. But the fair expected this constant reenactment over and over for onlookers to judge. The Anglo perpetuated savagery and stereotyped the world only knew of them, which, get, which went against the Igorot culture in reality.